Hello and welcome back to the channel. In this video I am going to talk about Americans and this is because I have a lot of experience of negotiating with Americans. I have done so for many years and by and large I have found American negotiators to be decently competent. Now like anybody else, any nation, you will get a range of pretty bad to exceptional. So, so far, uh, in perhaps uh, maybe this is a quirk of the work that I am in, but all the American negotiators I have dealt with, while some of them perhaps might be described as dull, none of them, I would say, can be described as incompetent. And some of them, of course, can be described as very good. So now this is the case for anyone that you tend to deal with. And I do tend to deal with a lot of amateur and not very good negotiators, unfortunately, because there are many people who think they, they can negotiate, but actually can't. Now, negotiation is a bit of a different concept to Americans than it might be to Europeans. So if anyone were to ask me, is there a difference between negotiating with a European negotiator and an American one, I would say, yes, there is. Now, of course, there are exceptions to any rule. But what you will rapidly notice, if you negotiate as often with them as I do, is that European negotiators have a much more collaborative style. Now, let me re-emphasize things I've said before, which is collaborative style is an approach. It doesn't necessarily mean that the negotiation itself is not adversarial. So by contrast, American negotiators tend to hover more on the adversarial side of the, you know, the spectrum. However, the really good American negotiators understand collaborative style and they will use it. And you tend to notice those differences. However, there is a default for American negotiators and that is toward the adversarial. And this is because of the education, the training, the legal system, and the politics. And the latter is the part I am particularly going to focus on in this video, because I am going to talk about the worst negotiators in America, in America and that is their politicians. Specifically, what has triggered this video is the news that Kevin McCarthy has finally managed to get himself elected as a Speaker of the House of Congress. And it has not been at all a smooth ride for him to achieve that. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about the politics of those events. Um, I cannot claim to be any kind of deep expert in American politics, even though I do follow um, American politics with interest. What I'm going to focus on are some of the key negotiation concepts that had leapt out to me as a result of what has happened to Kevin McCarthy. So like I said, take this as what this is. This is an analysis of some negotiation concept because there are some obvious lessons that we can draw here. And I would like to highlight that to people. So for anyone new to this channel, I am a professional negotiator of over a decade's worth of experience dealing with Americans, Europeans, and a whole host of other nationals. And I use this channel to talk about negotiations and to teach people how to conduct good professional negotiations. Now, in order to get elected as Speaker of the House of Congress, Kevin McCarthy went through, I think it was six or seven different rounds of negotiation, uh, not negotiations, sorry, of elections, of voting, um, which is pretty unprecedented in American politics, apparently. It hadn't happened for a very long time. What I want to highlight is the fact that that has happened immediately tells you there has been a failure, a failure of negotiation. Specifically, this is preparation. And as everybody knows, whenever you're going to do a task, you need to prepare for it well. So the fact that McCarthy has gone through six failed voting rounds would pretty much indicate that 
preparation had not been done well. Now, whether you blame McCarthy or whether you blame the wider Republican Party, particularly the Congress men and women, that is a matter of politics. But it is very clear that they fail to understand one of the key principles of negotiation uh, within this you know, preparation category. Now, I call this biting your own side. Other negotiators may have their own less catchy name for it. But this is the one I like to go with. And I specifically picked this because I like to highlight to people that a part of the preparation phase, well, firstly, you need to understand that preparation for a negotiation probably will occupy 80 to 90 percent of all negotiation time, all the time spent uh, being involved in any kind of negotiation. There's a lot to do. Uh, and even if it's a short negotiation, actually getting ready for it will still take most of the time. And a key element of that is that if you have many people that need to agree on any one thing, then you need to put the time and effort in to making sure all those people do actually agree. And of course, guess what? In the majority of times, not everybody is going to agree. Not everybody is going to be on board. Not everybody is going to understand. They're going to have their own agenda. They're not going to be comfortable, whatever it may be. So anybody leading any kind of negotiation or trying to lead any time a group of people, actually, for that matter, needs to devote this time to dealing with all those people um, who do not agree. And this is where a lot of people get tripped up. They kind of try and ignore or marginalise or sideline those that do not agree with them. Now, Kevin McCarthy couldn't do that. He didn't have a significant enough majority. And many lazy politicians, or even by necessity, particularly in the sort of UK and US political systems, will only focus on a smaller group of people that they need because they usually will have a large majority. So they can afford to marginalise or ignore a group of people. McCarthy obviously couldn't do that. The Republicans could not do that. So this is a key lesson for anyone engaged in any negotiation. It is absolutely critical that prior to being involved in any negotiation, you lock everybody in a room, shut the door, and you settle your differences. And you do that before you go anywhere near the public, anywhere near the negotiation table. This is the time when you figure out what the obstacles are and what you can do to solve them. You figure out what differences there are and you argue with those people. Hopefully it doesn't come to a proper fist fight, but if that is what is necessary, that is what happens. And you do that all behind closed doors. And you take as long as you need to until you've got the numbers. That is a critical lesson that any leader of any political party should learn early on, is that if you've got differences like that, you take everyone into a room with the closed doors and you sort it out and you keep on going until you can get everybody to agree on a common position. What you don't do is go right out, go straight into voting without a clue as to how much opposition you are going to face. Unless, of course, you are um, engaged in bad politics, shall we say. So the next negotiation concept that I want to highlight is presenting a united front. So having done all the preparation work, having fought your own side, settled your differences, and there may still be lingering differences, what everybody needs to understand is that you have a common position. Now, you may not have unanimous agreement to a common position. You may end up being um, a majority decision, shall we say. But the whole point is, is progress in life is achieved by reaching some form of consensus. Consensus does not mean you fully agree with the consensus. Consensus can mean that you accept that that is the majority decision and that your role is to support it. Even if you 
don't fully agree with it. But that is your role. And that is very important in politics because perception is key. It is also important in any negotiation because nothing can undermine negotiation faster than it looking like the other side really don't agree with each other. Um, never mind having to argue their position with the opposite side. So having settled your differences, any negotiation team, when they go into that negotiation room to conduct their negotiations with the opposite side, everybody in that team presents a united front and agrees with the position being forward, the argument being made, and supports that objective to the best extent possible. If something arises during the negotiation where they think that is not working, and that whoever is leading is perhaps going down the wrong path, then the way you resolve that is you ask for a break, you find a quiet room somewhere, and then you argue the case. You do not do it in front of the other side during the negotiation itself, um, unless you absolutely have no choice. So this is critical, and this is something that we can clearly see not a strength, of the Republican Party in the US. They really do not present a united front. Perhaps comparing and contrasting them a little bit with the Conservative Party in the UK, you can see that they very much struggle to present a united front. They have some fundamental disagreements. However, by and large, all Conservative MPs understand the importance of this concept which is why, as unpalatable as they may find certain conservative positions, they will vote and support for it and argue their case in private. This does not appear to be quite so much the case for the Republicans. And the end result is, is that even though Kevin McCarthy may now have been elected Speaker, the reality is that his leadership has been, I don't know, fatally, is certainly significantly undermined. And the ability of the Republican Party in Congress to project agreement and project leadership and authority has also been undermined as a consequence because they did not follow this principle and they did not present a united front as part of this whole election process. Now I'm going to use a dirty word in American politics and that word is compromise. By contrast, in most European politics and perhaps other countries around the world, compromise is far from a dirty word. Compromise is a very positive and good word. People understand the importance of compromise in order to achieve certain objectives. By contrast, US politicians don't. They don't like to compromise. They don't like to be seen to compromise. And the end result is, is that, well, quite frankly, it causes a significant level of harm to US democracy and US politics. Because if two sides cannot reach a compromise, then certain things cannot happen. And we've seen a lot of that in recent years. So, for example, approving the US budget. If both sides cannot compromise in order to agree the US budget, then the US government kind of runs out of money. It's not able to continue to function and has to shut down. That is, seems to be an interesting quirk of US politics. And I think this is very much linked to their adversarial system. But it is also linked to the individuals involved and the culture involved. Because anyone going into a negotiation with an attitude of not being willing to compromise is not really negotiating. That sort of individual is seeking to either dictate or impose their views upon others. Now, fine, if you are a big fish in a small pond, you can probably get away with doing that. But if there's a few hundred of you and you all consider yourself big fishes, then you're probably going to be sent, you know, stuck there for a very long time, uncompromisingly arguing with each other. 
And I think this is very much a hallmark of the US political system. So this is the thing that any leader of any political party or any kind of organization at all kind of needs to understand. Is if you're stuck in a situation where people have some pretty strong differences, you absolutely have to have a plan and have the attitude of, I need to identify where the areas of alignment or non-alignment are. That's your first step. You figure out what it is people might agree on and what it is they won't. And by doing that, you start to knock down all of various issues. You start to take a big problem and break it up into a series of smaller problems. That is what a lot of negotiation is about. Identifying areas of alignment is crucial if you are to compromise, because what occasionally bad negotiators do, I say occasionally, actually quite common, is they try and negotiate a compromise on everything all at once. They overreach. And I think this seems to be particularly true of American politicians as well. They like to think big picture and big issues and so on. But actually, by taking that attitude and not breaking down a problem into smaller, more manageable chunks, it makes it a lot harder to reach compromise. Now, I'm not fully up to speed with the politics of this. Some people may justifiably argue that the individuals that blocked Kevin McCarthy um, from reaching a compromise themselves are individuals that will not compromise. They, you can describe them as dogmatic, perhaps. And it's also important to understand that there are times when you shouldn't compromise. This can be seen in the Ukrainian attitude to uh, the, the war and whatever President Putin says. President Putin may offer temporary ceasefires or offer to negotiate. But Ukraine are not compromising on their fundamental position that Russian troops need to be off their territory before they're willing to agree truces and negotiation. And this is because they have made a judgment. They have made a judgment that Putin cannot be trusted and that there is no genuine compromise with him. And that's fine if you're on opposite side of a particular dispute, you walk away. When If you make that judgment, well, normally you walk away. You make that, if that other side isn't going to agree to what you need, you break off the negotiation, you know, go your separate ways. Politics is not like that. Politics is you're forced into that situation by circumstances. War, I suppose, equally similar in that regard. So you have to reach some kind of compromise at some point. And I emphasize at some point, because if you're dealing with a fundamentally objectionable individual, who what they want triggers your red lines, your key principles of things you cannot, cannot uh, compromise on, then you're going to have to find ways of negotiating around that or shift in the other person's view uh, or their frames of reference. And that is not an easy thing to do. However, in the case of the Republican Party, surely the objective is to govern. And if your objective is to govern, then being dogmatic about various things is detrimental to that key objective. And so that would be the crucial task for anyone who leads or negotiates in that sort of arena, is to have everybody understanding what the objectives are, what the true objectives are, and where they all align. And if people are completely unwilling to recognize the key principles of red lines of the other protagonists in that meeting, in that negotiation, then they perhaps might have a bit of an attitude problem, to put it that way. This can be argued either way. But the point I want to make here is that the process of negotiation is all about identifying alignment and where compromise is or isn't possible. Because if you do not do those things and you do not do them well, you will not be able to reach the end of that negotiation with a successful outcome. So the final lesson that I would like to draw out from the election of Kevin McCarthy as Speaker are the 
three particular points. The first is good preparation. Kevin McCarthy and the Republican Party had settled their differences before casting their votes. They garnered to those closed rooms and fought themselves to a standstill until they've reached a common position. This would have prevented the mess that they found themselves in. So understanding the scale of the problem and addressing it is all a key element of any preparation, you know, any strategy to get ready. And so, as I've already pointed out, the Republicans and Kevin McCarthy failed to do that. But that is what people need to understand about any negotiation. If you, any, and in my experience, probably 90, maybe even 90% of all negotiation failures can be linked to poor preparation. So this is an absolutely crucial point that you really do want to put the time and effort into preparation. And it is still very surprising how few people actually do this. Second point to raise is that negotiation is a team sport. There's obviously lots of Republicans that didn't get their memo on that one. It is absolutely crucial that uh, you support the team, you support the side, because let's be honest, if you don't agree, if you don't have the same overall objective, if you don't want the same thing, and let's assume that you know most Republicans do actually want to govern the country, then why are you in the team? If that is not the team for you, then maybe you should be in a different team. So as part of the preparation stage and fighting your own side, yes, you argue your case and you try and win it. But if you fail to win it or if you have to compromise on it, then you have to knuckle down and, and support the team. And that is absolutely crucial for negotiations um, because lack of team coherence, as with any sport, will often manifest itself in how that team performs on the day. So support the team, support the negotiation, achieve the outcome, or decide that that's not the team for you or that's not the outcome you want to achieve. Make a decision, basically. And the final point, which links perhaps that previous one, is that successful negotiation is all about focusing on what matters. What are the details? What are the key principles? What are the areas of alignment and differences? What is important? What is a red line? And what is a tradable, perhaps? So if you want to success, succeed in any negotiation, or even in politics as a political party, I know, no politicians are extraordinarily bad at this. You need to park your ego, your vanity and your biases, and you need to focus on the matters at hand. Now, politicians, by and large, tend to be pretty badly behaved you know, children. Let's accept that as reality. But for anybody else in the business world, in government or anything else going into a negotiation, this is crucial. This is what you do. You don't take your ego and biases to work. You park them outside in the car. Whatever little fetish you may have, you don't take it to work. Same in any negotiation. So you focus on what matters and you get the job done by working together and acting professionally. And I think professional, perhaps a word, probably we shouldn't link to politicians. So I hope you found that this video helpful. Um, just a little one, just to focus on some negotiation concepts. And uh, I'll do another video soon that I think will be a bit juicier to the UK audience. So thank you very much for watching this. Please do like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.